Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special evening honoring the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Struggle of 1963. This is part of the Barbara Lee and Elihu Harris Lecture Series. Promises to be a fabulous evening. On behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, we welcome you. The students and staff of the Freedom Center welcome our distinguished guests. We are grateful to collaborate with Merritt College, our partner in producing the Barbara Lee and L.U. Harris Lecture Series. We also acknowledge our peers, the schools and youth organizations that work hard to assist youth in becoming the women and men we are meant to be. The Freedom Center offers classes based on the words and works of Dr. King and Cesar Chavez. We help students from the sixth grade on to integrate into their own lives, to participate in the community's efforts to solve problems and to organize. We help develop strong warriors who confront racism and the meaninglessness of the addiction to consumerism. Truly, this is a special event for not only Merritt College, but for the Martin Luther King Freedom Center. We are so proud to be able to offer, through the Barbara Lee and L.U. Harris Lecture Series, this special opportunity that I think will also be a defining year for us in listening to the four remarkable daughters of uh, decades five decades ago, in which history was made and continues to be made, especially here in Alameda County in Oakland, California. To get to the heart of tonight's event, let me call on your Congresswoman since 1998, a woman whose own path to Capitol Hill is strewn with challenges. In 1963, she was a senior in high school in Southern California. Her drive and desire to exceed stalled, but not stopped by single motherhood. Achieving that college degree nonetheless, her activist roots, perhaps molded in the Black Panther movement, birthed right here in Oakland where she worked in community projects, and then worked on Bobby Seale's uh, mayoral challenge, which whetted her political appetite as she welded her way through the legislative ranks until one day she found herself the only member of Congress voting against the war in Iraq. These little footnotes and tidbits all part of the history that makes up who and what she is and her fight for equality and social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Tonight, we are celebrating, well, really commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement, which brought this country one step closer to achieving liberty and justice for all. Now, I have the honor and the privilege to, meet the, to have met these four great women during the Civil Rights pilgrimages and really wanted them to get to know my district, who I always remind folks that you really are the most enlightened, progressive, and diverse congressional district in the country. And I say that over and over and over again. Yes, you are. And so I'm so proud of your activism and really continuing to work for peace and justice. And I wanted you to get to know them 
for their stories of their families during the Civil Rights Movement are so powerful but yet they continue to stay involved and work to complete the unfinished business in the movement of which there is much. When we look at the increase in poverty, unemployment rates, the lack of investment in public education, the injustice in the supposedly criminal justice system, when we look at the bloated Pentagon budget, when we look at how that budget's taken away the badly needed resources for nation building here at home, when we look at our moral imperative to pass comprehensive immigration reform, there is a lot of work still to do. Lots of work, much work to do. And so tonight we will get a glimpse of their historical past and learn what, as the title of one of Dr. King's most, I think one of his most profound books, it's called, Where Do We Go From Here? chaos or community. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have had the privilege to get to know all of these tremendous women, and now I would like for you to get to know them. And I would like to remind us all that we are a region which continues to work on so many fronts to reclaim Dr. King's dream for a world free from racism, poverty, and war. So thank you again tonight. God bless you. Um, there are some who write history. There are some who make history. There are some who experience history. Martin Luther King said in Birmingham, Alabama, I don't know how many historians we have in the room tonight, but we are certainly making a marvelous chapter for the historians of the future. Well, all of the women that you will meet this evening were making history, experiencing history, and being a part of writing history. So we don't have long to talk. I think it's more important to do show and tell. Could you please put the images there? We are on the screen. So I just want you all to know that the young ladies that will be coming there, fathers are politicians, were politicians. Well, my dad was just a good old Southern Baptist minister. He was a preacher, and here you can see the people before the church, and you can barely see those teeny-weeny little figures there, but that was Daddy and Uncle Martin standing there. And you see, it was the days of segregation, and I don't have long to talk, but I want you to be able to see the colored uh, signs, colored seating. And then on December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for seating, being seated where she was supposed to be seated. She was following the law. Here you see her mug shot. And so, my dad decided that when Rosa was arrested that he needed to organize, and that's exactly what he did. He organized the first mass meeting. Uh, he worked at the local NAACP, and Rosa Parks was the secretary there, and he was the second man in charge under E.D. Nixon. And so he said to E.D. Nixon, do me a favor, call my friend Martin Luther King and invite him to join, and that's exactly what Uncle Martin did. This is my dad's church, and we were so hungry for our freedom because we had endured 244 years of slavery. We'd always been pushed in the back and told that we were less than, told that we were ugly, told that we were dirty, but we knew we were beautiful inside. We just wanted to have that opportunity to show the world. We wanted our equality. This is the earliest picture of Daddy and Uncle Martin, and there they are marching. They're walking to the courthouse because Rosa has been, she's on trial. Uh, for her arrest on December 5th, and there they are with Bayard Rustin, who came down, and initially the civil rights movement was not gonna be nonviolent. They were just gonna, it was just gonna be a one-day protest, but Bayard came from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and it became a nonviolent protest because he introduced the idea of nonviolence. And there's Uncle Martin in front of the church because he was a minister, that's what they were. And there they are, you know, it's what started as a one-day boycott, went for 381 days. And here we are, and they are in front of the cars. That's Daddy, Edie Nixon, Uncle Martin, and Rosa, Cousin Rosa, that's how we called her. There she is. 
and I'm sure doing show and tell, so you all bear with me. That's a colored sign. You young people don't know anything about it, but it was the world that I knew when I was growing up. We couldn't go to the public restaurants, and we couldn't go to the public bathrooms. Everything was separate, and so my mother wouldn't let us go. That's my dad. Our daddy and Uncle Martin were arrested. That's my dad's mugshot. That's Uncle Martin as he was arrested, because Daddy was arrested first and then Uncle Martin, and he said, Ralph, please come with me. He was too shy. He didn't want to go by himself, so Daddy went with Uncle Martin to be arrested. <laughs> and there's Uncle Martin as his first mugshot. And that's Joanne Robinson. You know, women don't get the credit, but Joanne Robinson ran the Women's Political Committee, and she organized the women, and they were doing something because Rosa Parks was not the first but the third woman to be arrested. And she decided we were going to have that mass boycott starting December 5th. And there they are at the Highlander Library learning nonviolence. And that white man, that tall white man that you see, that's Pete Seeger. You know, he pinned together those beautiful words we're going to sing later, We Shall Overcome. And that's Karis Horton, whose father, Miles Horton, ran the Highlander Folk School where they learned nonviolence. There they are on the bus, and that white man that you see right there, that's Glenn Smiley. He's a man who taught Daddy and Uncle Martin the principles of nonviolence. And I want you to know that he did it. Bayet came down, but Bayet left, but Glenn was the one who taught. And whenever you people see people, see Uncle Martin with a white man, know that that white man was Glenn Smiley. And uh, here they are again on that bus after that successful 381-day boycott. That's my parents' home that was bombed. And uh, Mark Kennedy, the husband of Peggy Wallace Kennedy, they were telling me about this place, my home, that has become this museum, this birth home. Well, my mother was pregnant with me that evening. She got up. She said an angel awakened her, and she left the living room and went into the bedroom. And 15 minutes later, the bomb exploded. When I would be born that August, I would come out of my mother's womb shaking, and invariably when I'm in a stressful situation, my hands start to show, quiver and shake, and there's nothing I can do. It's the trauma that we carry with us from those situations. That's the house again. They bombed our homes, they bombed our churches. That night they bombed five places. Our home, my dad's church, First Baptist, they bombed the home of Reverend Robert Gratz, a white minister for being a white minister uh, with a black congregation, Bell Street and Mount Olive. Hatred was rampant. This is just show and tell, and that was the hatred that was trying to stop us. Why were they burning a cross? My God, the cross, it's a symbol of love, and how it turned to a symbol of hate, uh, I do not know. And here you see a black woman being beaten, and there's a purse on the ground. This is Montgomery, Alabama. This was the time that I grew up. It's a world that I knew. You see they're grabbing her by her, uh, her uh, ankles upside down. This is a Freedom Riders, 1961. This is in Anniston, Alabama, when they set the bus on fire. That's my dad that night at the church. These are the people that were sleeping in the church, my dad's church, First Baptist Church. You see them on the pews. They were afraid to go outside because the KKK was going to kill them. And then the National Guard that Bobby Kennedy sent in, there they are. Anyway, that's the press conference they had the following morning in my mother's uh, house. And I was a little girl witnessing that. That's John Lewis, Uncle Martin, Daddy, and James Foreman from CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And that's, uh, you can see the patch on John Lewis's head from where he was beaten. And then there were the troop, the, the police who were angry about the buses, the white, the colored, and finally the National Guard, the Freedom Riders, Uncle Martin in our house. And that's me, that little girl sitting on Uncle Martin's lap and mother and Aunt Coretta, and me and my sister and Aunt Coretta. And then Uncle Martin and Marty and, and Yoki and then the KKK that tried to stop them, and there they are. This is Anniston, Alabama. And there they are getting arrested, and there they are in jail. You know, my dad went to jail 44 times, Uncle Martin went to jail 13 times, and they weren't in there for being drunk or beating their wives. They were in there for demanding liberty and justice for all of us. And after that, Uncle Martin had written the letter from the Birmingham jail, and the young people were all stirred up. They turned the dogs on us. Little children were arrested, demanding freedom. Then they turned the water hoses on us. I think I should let you just pictures stay for them, speak for themselves. It's better show and tell that kind of way. I don't want anybody to forget what happened here. I don't want anybody to sugarcoat it. It's the reality of the world that I knew growing up. Too many people suffered for us to have our rights for freedom. 
So that's Daddy and Uncle Martin continue. I'll never forget being a child at the March on Washington, sitting there on the steps as Uncle Martin said, I have a dream. And when he said, my four little children, my sister and I jumped up and down screaming. Yoki wasn't there that day. Marty and Dexter weren't there, there that day, but I was there with my sister. It was a great moment. And those are the people. And right after that, on September 15th, five girls went to the bathroom, not four. My friend Sarah Collins, who is my partner in a movie that we're writing right now, Sarah was 12 years old. Her sister Addie Mae was, 15, uh, was 14. Their friend Denise McNair was 11. Carol Robinson and Cynthia Wesley, they all went to the bathroom. It was Children's Day. It was the first time the children were ever going to take over the church. They were all wearing white, and they were in the bathroom. They were primping. Sarah went into the stall. Denise said to Addie Mae, will you tie my sash? As she got ready to tie the sash, they heard an explosion. And in came shards of glass. The girls were killed. Sarah was the only one left standing. She said God left her standing for a reason. I just want you to see. There they are. Because they died, that's my friend Sarah who survived. You know, everybody gives the girls and remembers the girls, but nobody remembers my friend Sarah. I want you to remember Sarah. And Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed for a night march. And because he was killed, they decided to have a march. And that's exactly what they did. Jose Williams and John Lewis. And as they crossed that Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were met by angry policemen. And you can see how they're being trampled. I don't want you anyone to tell you about it. I want you to see what happened. They met them on horseback. It was devastating. So Daddy and Uncle Martin came together and tried to figure out what to do. That night, they killed Reverend James Reeb as well, a white minister, for being involved. They're marching again. That's the, for Reverend James Reeb, an Episcopal priest, and that's Dan and Uncle Martin. My dad's praying. And then they tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge a second time. And they weren't allowed. They trampled the young white children and the young white students. Ah, here we finally got that chance to march. It was incredible, 55 miles from Selma to Montgomery. But there were people that were angry and hateful. And I was there along that march. And there, you'll be able to see, is that you, Lucy, that little girl right there? That's Lucy. You see her standing behind her father's head as he's signing the Voting Rights Act. And Daddy and Uncle Martin are waiting. And that young woman all the way to the right is Vivian Malone, who Peggy's father was trying to stop from integrating the University of Alabama. And then they shook hands, and it was done. And we got the right to vote. As Lyndon Johnson's daughter, I've had the blessing of being an eyewitness to history on many occasions, but none more precious than holding the hand of my hero, Congressman John Lewis, as we marched with Vice President Biden, members of Congress, and civil rights heroes across the Pettus Bridge in Selma. With tears running down my cheeks and memories flooding my heart, I thank God for the sacrifices of those who had fought and died for freedom and recommitted myself to continuing the fight for social justice. 41 years ago, my father made his final public address at the first Civil Rights Symposium in the Presidential Library that bears his name. All who were there will never forget watching a very ill and a very old-looking Lyndon Johnson make his last impassioned plea for civil rights. He was just 64, two years younger than I am today. In the middle of his speech, Daddy took a nitroglycerin pill, and I rushed to be near him afterwards. 
He explained that an angina attack had kept him up all night, and his doctor had admonished him that if he made that speech, he could not guarantee that he'd walk off the stage alive. I asked my father, why on earth had he come under those circumstances? And Daddy shook his head in bewilderment that his own child didn't get the obvious lesson and said, because my child if I had died, I would have gone dying for what I lived for. What more could any man want? Less than six weeks later, Daddy was dead. He had gone dying for what he lived for. My father's civil rights record is very public. The Civil Rights Bill of 1964 ending legal segregation in our public places, restaurants, motels, transportation. The Voting Rights Bill of 1965 ensuring people of every color the right to vote. The 1965 Fair Housing Act ensuring the right to buy a home in any neighborhood, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity. And the 1968 Immigration Act ending ethnic and racial immigration quotas. Histor <laughs> Historians will tell the public story. Tonight I want to share our family's very personal story. Our civil rights journey was all so very personal. Daddy's first experience with racial discrimination began when he taught in a Mexican school in order to put himself through college. Bored, his students often fought at recess as they were denied any playground equipment by an impoverished and indifferent school district. Desperate to help them, my father spent some of his own limited resources on bats and balls for the kids. He found his payoff in happier children at recess and ones more ready to learn when they returned to the classroom. I'll never forget hearing of this story in a joint session of Congress in 1964. He told the world that never in his fondest dreams did he think he would have the chance to help the sons and daughters of the poor students that he had taught. But ladies and gentlemen, I have that chance now, and I aim to do something about it. <laughs> and do something we did. As a young girl, I remember driving from Texas to Washington, D.C. with my mother and witnessing our housekeeper, Patsy, being denied entrance to a motel simply because she was black. My mother was incensed and hurt, and we drove on. The great moments of the civil rights are all intertwined in the great moments in our family's life. The Public Accommodation Act was signed on my 17th birthday, and no one will ever receive a more precious birthday present. <laughs> on the day that the 1965 Voting Rights Act was signed, as Donzelle just showed you, I was on daddy duty, which meant I would go with my father to the ceremony. I remember asking my daddy, why are we going to the Capitol? probably because I saw the White House as taking less time from my busy adolescent schedule. His response was of a disappointed teacher who couldn't understand why his own daughter didn't get the obvious lesson. Lucy Baines, we are going to the Capitol because there are many brave men and women who won't be coming back to this Congress because of the stand they have taken today and because there are many great men and women who will be coming to the Congress who never could have come except for this Congress's courageous vote like your own great Congresswoman from this district. We need to thank these heroes in the halls of Congress that they have served so heroically. Standing beside leaders of Congress and members of the Civil Rights Movement, I watched in awe as my father used many pens to sign the great legislation into law and gave them to the heroes of the day. On the way home, I asked Daddy, with all the great civil rights leaders there, 
Why on earth did you give the first pen to the Republican leader, Senator Dirksen? <laughs> I was only called Lucy Baines when I was found wanting. And once more, he shook his head and said, Lucy Baines, I didn't have to convert one of those great civil rights leaders to, for this legislation. They were already for it. But without Senator Dirksen's support, those civil rights leaders and I would just have had a bill. Because of Everett Dirksen, we have a law. He deserved the pen, and I wanted the world to know it. I grew up in an area of Washington fondly called Hanukkah Heights because it was a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. We lived there because my father found the restrictive real estate covenants in other areas of Washington, D.C. morally repugnant. One of my closest friends was the first Jew allowed to break the restricted covenant in the D.C. area of Spring Valley. The fair housing bill made it possible for others to do so everywhere. It was all so very personal. I will always be grateful that a courageous young Texas Congressman, George Herbert Walker Bush, cast his vote for important civil rights legislation. It was a time of bipartisanship for public good that we can all be proud of. That spirit is needed now more than ever. It seems only right to conclude this sentimental family journey with a story my father told me at the end of the Civil Rights Symposium in 1972. A little old lady from the Temperance Union approached Prime Minister Winston Churchill after the war, accusing him of drinking enough alcohol during the war to fill an entire room up to here, chastising him for his example and challenging him to reform. Churchill looked on with a certain amount of satisfaction and amusement. And instead of raising his temper, he was reported to have replied, my dear, dear lady, so little have I done, so much I have yet to do. <laughs> then Daddy went on to say, let no one delude himself that our work is done. We have proved that great progress is possible. We know how much still remains to be done. And if our efforts continue, and if our will is strong, and if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. This past summer, the United States Supreme Court struck down the protection of Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. I cried. I knew states who had passed voter ID laws would make it harder for the poor and the elderly to vote because their access to government-issued IDs is impeded by their circumstances. You don't have a driver's license if you're too poor to have a car or too old are too isolated. The record of fraud that these laws were designed to prevent does not exist. And now, I desperately fear, neither will the record of our most vulnerable voting, unless, of course, we all come to their aid. <laughs> Great progress has been made in the last 50 years, but our work is unfinished. For until there is equality in our schools, until there is equality in our justice system, until there is equality in our purchasing power, and until there is equality in our health care emancipation, will only be a proclamation, but not a fact. I have 13 grandchildren. I want theirs to be a more just generation. And I believe, as my father did, that with our continued commitment to social justice for all, we shall one day overcome. Thank you. I am just 
so happy to be here with all of you this evening, and especially with Barbara Lee, who is one of my personal heroes. We are so blessed to have you in our midst and as our leader and in Washington, and now as the President Obama's special representative to the United Nations. Thank you, Barbara Lee, for all you do. As you heard, I work in international human rights. People ask how I became involved in human rights. And um, well, if you have seven brothers, you appreciate human rights at a very young age. Um, my earliest memories are when my father was the attorney general at the height of the civil rights movement. And my mother really did not, my parents really didn't separate their home life from their work life. So. Um, my mother would take six or seven of us and a couple of dogs and a football and bring us down to the Justice Department and we would run around and, and see my dad. And then our favorite thing to do was to go in the tunnel underneath the Justice Department over to the FBI building to watch the sharpshooters at practice. <laughs> now, the head of the FBI at that time was J. Edgar Hoover. And he was a man not known for his love of children or his sense of humor. And um, now, this is the weird part about this story, which is that in the bottom of the FBI building, there was a suggestion box. How about that? Anyway, one day, my mother took out her telltale red pen and wrote a suggestion, put that into the box. And then she, as she was gathering up the kids and the football and the dogs and bringing us back to my father's office, which took her a few minutes, um, a very astute FBI agent went and took that suggestion out of the box and brought it up to J. Edgar Hoover, who read it and then had it immediately sent to Daddy. And so when we were walking back into Daddy's office, he was opening the suggestion. And the suggestion was, get a new director. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this was, a, this was a, an important lesson at a very young age in the importance of speaking truth to power. Um, on another visit to Daddy's office, uh, he wrote me a letter, and I still have that letter on my wall at my home, and it says, Dear Carrie, today was a historic day, not only because of your visit, but because two African Americans were allowed to register at the University of Alabama over the objections of the governor. It happened just a few moments ago, and I hope these events are long past by the time you get your pretty little head to college. Love and kisses, Daddy. Well, there are a lot of changes that happened from the time he wrote that letter till the time I got to college, and from then until today. But still, not enough has changed. Our schools are desegregated, but only 10% of the bachelor's degrees earned each year go to black Americans. Our racist literacy tests have been banned from polling places, but African Americans wait online at polls twice as long as white Americans, an average of 23 minutes to vote compared to 12 minutes for whites. Our on-the-books employment discrimination laws have been struck down, but only six Fortune 500 companies have CEOs who are black. And in the previous census, a black child in America today is three times more likely than a white child to, be, to grow up in poverty. These realities are unacceptable. They are an affront to America, but they are also no mystery. In many ways, we've replaced upfront deliberate discrimination with unspoken structural discrimination. The Voting Rights Act, the crown jewel of the American Civil Rights Movement, is under attack in states from North Carolina to Texas since the Supreme Court gutted the Section 4 formula in June. Florida's stand-your-ground laws have already been used to excuse the unprovoked slaughter of an, of an African-American child once this year. 
And this week, in one of Detroit's infamously segregated suburbs, an African-American teen, Renisha McBride, knocked on a door for help after her car broke down and was shot in the face and killed by a white homeowner mistaken for an intruder. She was 19 years old, alone in a new neighborhood, and scared. Our prison laws disproportionately target and incarcerate people of color. African Americans are 21% more likely to receive mandatory minimum sentences than white defendants, and 20% more likely to be sentenced to prison. Even the U.S. Sentencing Commission found that black offenders receive sentences that are 10% longer than white offenders for the same crimes. Today, these structural, excuse me, the statistics for Hispanic Americans and other families of color continue these trends. Each one of these statistics represents a family disrupted, a child raised with less than what we owe the next generation. Today, these structural obstacles to opportunity are just, real, just as real as the, the deliberate obstacles that my father dedicated his career to eliminating so many years ago. Now, when you think about all of these statistics, it's easy to grow cynical and to retreat into our own contained and demanding worlds of, of family and work and um, and the other problems that we confront uh, that confront us. But I'd like to share with you a story that happened to me. When I was 21 years old, I took a summer internship at Amnesty International in Washington, D.C. And I w spent that time documenting abuses committed by U.S. immigration officials against refugees from El Salvador. And I was horrified to learn that my country was treating the most destitute with such disdain. But I also learned about refuseniks in Russia and anti-apartheid activists in South Africa and the mothers of the disappeared in El Salvador. And I learned that there was a, a whole world out there of activists who were trying to create change in their in their countries. The cause was compelling, the enemy was dangerous and powerful, but I found that I was surrounded by Davids who with little more than the slingshots of their heart and nerve and sinew to support them, stood up against a world full of Goliaths. And if you look back at, what the, at the changes that have been made around the world over the last 30 years, it looks like the angels prevailed. So when I started working in 1981, all of Latin America was under right-wing military dictatorships. Today, there's not a right-wing military dictatorship left standing. All, yeah. All of Eastern Europe was under communist leaders. Today, there's not a communist government in Eastern Europe. South Africa was at the height of apartheid. Today, South Africa is at a series of freely elected governments elected by a majority of their people. And women's rights was not on the international agenda. In fact, it wasn't until Hillary Clinton went to China in 1995 and declared women's rights are human rights, which was revolutionary at the time, that women's rights got on the international agenda. And since then, CEDAW, which is the Women's Rights Convention at the United Nations, has been ratified by 183 different countries. Oh. Now, how did those changes take place? None of those changes took place because governments wanted them to. In fact, governments tried to stop them. And they didn't take place because armies wanted them to. In fact, great armies tried to stop them. And they didn't take place because huge multinational corporations wanted them to. In fact, multinational corporations wanted to stop them. They took place because small groups of determined people, as Margaret Mead said, harnessed the dream of freedom and made it come true. And they band together and they said, what's going on is wrong and we're gonna create change. So I just wanna leave you with this. We're here tonight 
listening to these incredible stories of the civil rights movement. And that's important because it's part of our history. But it's really part of our present and part of our future. And what we need to learn tonight is how you create change. How do you create structural change in our, in our community, in our country, and our world? And that's the lessons we all have to work, walk out of here with, that each of us has a role to play, that each of us can work together to create change, and that's how our world is going to get better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I was born in 1950 in the small rural town of Clayton, Alabama, to George and Lurleen Burns Wallace, at a time when racial segregation was a cultural norm throughout the South. I was 13 years old when my father proclaimed, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, in his inaugural address, in January of 1963, after being sworn in as governor of Alabama. Those six words would become a permanent commentary on the character of Governor George Wallace and an inescapable burden for his children. On June 11, 1963, less than five months after he became governor, my father journeyed back to his alma mater, the University of Alabama, to stand in the schoolhouse door to prevent the enrollment of two African Americans, James Hood and Vivian Malone. It would yet become another defining moment in the character of George Wallace. My memories of June 11th, 1963, were very different from what anyone could imagine. I was with my mother at a wood frame cabin set deep in a slough of Lake Martin, Alabama, a place that offered Lurleen Burns Wallace comfort of how her life used to be alongside a rutted dirt road deep in the heart of Tuscaloosa County, simple, unobstructed, and safe a sense of peace that comes with escape. My feet dangle from the wooden seat of a makeshift swing laying lay low under the bough of an old oak tree. There was an unseen intruder on that day, a taunt wire that seemed to tug my mother up and down a small wooden pier jutting into the water, pulling one hand through her coarse mane of thick brown hair while coursing a cigarette in the other. Her security detail of one had grown to a cadre of uniformed state troopers. She stood alone and bereft. Where had I heard this wind before, changed like this to a deeper roar? What would it take my standing there for, holding open a restive door, looking downhill to a frothy shore, Summer was past and the day was past. Somber clouds in the west were massed. It was the day that my father stood in the schoolhouse door. I was 13 years old. My mother was 36. That day was the end of Lurleen Wallace's hope for a simpler life for it was the beginning of our living beneath the shadow of the schoolhouse door. How could my mother have known that in less than three years, she would become governor of Alabama, the sixth most admired woman in the world, and in less than five years, she would be dead, known by the world and loved by thousands. The images captured on June 11th, 1963 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, will forever remi remind us of the confrontation between George Wallace and Nicholas Katzenbach 
and the grace that Vivian Malone and James Hood demonstrated as they walked among angry crowds. But there are no photographs of a 13-year-old girl sitting on a swing under an old oak tree, watching her mother standing alone under the blaze of a summer sun. From that moment on, and for many years to come thereafter, my life, my politics, and my spirit were measured by that of my father as a mere reflection of Governor George C. Wallace. In 1972, my father was paralyzed in an assassination attempt in Laurel, Maryland. From that day on, he began his own journey on the road to Jericho. As the world focused on the events of May 15, 1972, and as he lay near death at Holy Cross Hospital, I witnessed the power of forgiveness in the eyes of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and Ethel Kennedy as they stood by his bed and offered prayers of hope for his life. It was a lesson to me about the rising above of the human spirit a moment that would one day inspire me to rise, to stand, and to find that promise of forgiveness in my heart. History tells of my father's journey to understanding through suffering as a result of his paralysis, of his deep sense of caring for people, for his acts of kindness to the downtrodden, and his changed heart. But still, there will always be the asterisk of the defiant George Wallace of the 1960s that will forever define and denote the character of my father. As I grew older and married and had children, I began to see myself separate and apart with a worldview of my own. In 1996, my husband and I took our then eight-year-old son, Burns, to Atlanta to visit the Martin Luther King National Historic Site. As we moved through the exhibits, we turned a corner only to face the visual images of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, fire hoses in Birmingham, and a, and a defiant George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. Burns stood silent for a long pause, and a look of sadness came over his face. He turned to me and asked, why did Papa do those things to other people? I realized that at that moment I was at a crossroad in my life and the life of my son. It was the first step in my journey of building a legacy of my own. I knelt down beside my son, I drew him close and said, Papa never told me why he did those things, but I know that he was wrong. So maybe it would just have to be up to me and you to help make things right. <laughs> Being here with you, is yet another stop on my own personal journey to raise the call for justice in our lifetime. Today is yet another day of the fulfillment of the promise that I made to my two sons. Today and all the tomorrows to come are opportunities for me to lay yet another stone on a legacy of my own. For most of my life, I lived in the shadow of history my life was measured by the accomplishments of others. I was the daughter, then wife, of powerful men. My life was measured by their success and not my, by my own. And then I came to understand the inherent power in each of us and the opportunity for change that my life story could bring to daughters and wives when they can see themselves separate and apart and be able to stand and speak because their life has worth and their voices. Applause 
and their voices can count for justice, for mercy, and change in their lifetime. Let us be judged each as one. Let us break the shackles of the past. Let us live extraordinary lives measured not by where we came from, but where we're going. And let us step from the shadows of self-doubt. Each one of us has the power to change first our own lives and then the lives of others. For years, I wandered in a life of indifference, always supporting but never leading, always learning but never teaching, always loving others but never loving myself, always believing in others but never in me, always in the crowd but never breaking away, believing that my life would be measured by the accomplishments of others but never by my own. But today, I stand before you as myself. And I ask you to proclaim a victory for yourself and to stand and speak with your own voice and love with your own heart, to believe that you have the power to change your world. Rise to proclaim that for too many Americans, the schoolhouse door of opportunity, equality, and freedom remains closed. Rise not just to remember how far we have come, but to commit to the struggle that lies ahead. There may be no more stands in the schoolhouse door, but the underbelly of discrimination still lies like a pall over America. rise to ask each other to stand in a schoolhouse door every day to encourage a child, to comfort a parent, to speak, to walk, and to pray for justice for all in our country in our lifetime. And rise to be better, not bitter. Stand your ground. Reach for a higher star. Stand firm when all others fade away. Be courageous and proclaim a victory of your own. Rise up for yourself and for your dignity so that one day your children and your grandchildren can say that your life had not been lived in vain. Thank you. And I'm going to start our little round table by starting out on the topic of nonviolence, our nonviolence expert. We were talking with uh, Don Lilly, and she was saying that as a child, her father taught them nonviolence in all things, even in play. <laughs> well, you know, nonviolence was just not rhetoric, it was just a way of life. And so, Daddy and Uncle Martin practice that nonviolence. Not one single time did they ever raise a hand to hit us or to hit our mothers. Um, it was just a way of life. And if we did something wrong, my father would get into the rocking chair and my, my grandmother's rocking chair that was in our bedroom and just rock and start to cry. And he, um, I guess he was the epitome of what we stereotypically call a Jewish mother because he worked the guilt thing on us. He'd cry and he said, I worked so hard to make a better world for you and you disappoint me. And when he would start to cry, we would start to cry and it was like, oh no, we'll, we'll do everything we can to please you, we'll do everything. But in, um, I think, Lucy, in conversation, I heard more direct conversation between you and your father than I've heard from some of the other panelists here. Did you have a special relationship? Was it because you were the baby? <laughs> well, uh, I, I adored my father, and I think he knew it. And most of us like being adored. <laughs> uh, but uh, being 
uh, an eyewitness to some of the historical moments uh, that took place in the White House was, were very special to me. My Uncle Dick looked over and he said, Lyndon, I can't, but I'll tell you this for sure, that if you do, our party will lose the South for at least a generation. And my father looked over him and, and said, well, Dick, if that is the price I have to pay, I'll gladly pay it. So yes, the answer to your question is, uh, I did have a very special relationship with my father and being able to be an eyewitness to conversations like that, nothing I deserved, but something I will be eternally grateful for. Thank you. We are very short on time, but there are just some things we have to ask. We talked about uh, your work uh, on the international scene. You come from a large family, you come from Kennedy's, there were many, many stars, and was there a struggle for you to find your place, your cause, as to how you could make an impact in this big picture? Uh, um, weirdly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 like I said, this was important to me. Even when I learned to tie my shoes, I made sure if I put my left one on first, I um, tied the right one first because I wanted there to be equality. And, uh, <laughs> I know. So I, this was just, when I got that job at Amnesty, I thought, wow, this is it. This is where I should be. That's the thing yes. I to pay. Peggy, I, I just wanted to ask you, you talked about you're doing this to have your own voice, but really because of your children. And I wonder, what's the conversation like with your children as you go through this transformation? Well, yes, we talked about it. And um, um, I, I told them that, well, first of all, I went and uh, to Selma, we, we marched over the bridge together with John Lewis, uh, Mark and I and the children. We did that. And um, that sort of pushed me a little bit. And so I realized then that I did not want the same legacy for them that I was living with. And so I, I talked with them about that. And I asked them if I, if I came out and with, with that, you know, public, with what, what I was going to do, would they be happy with that? And they said, yes, they would be really happy with that. Well, I have gotten my wrap-up cue a long time back. I just feel bad ending a historic moment. Uh, <laughs> even for another minute or two uh, to talk with you.